Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for an update on COVID-19 slash long COVID. There's recently been a discovery from the University of Virginia which might be a game changer when it comes to targeting long COVID. Now, it has been assumed that a subset of long COVID patients with fatigue as their base symptom may be suffering due to antibodies that are present and crucially remain in the blood after an infection with COVID-19. An article in Nature in 2024 highlighted that antibodies raised following a COVID-19 infection may be part of the pathology of long COVID after experiments whereby antibodies isolated from patients with long COVID were transferred into mice and those mice appeared to demonstrate both an increased pain sensitivity and a reduction in movement. Now, this study is particularly important because when trying to establish a pathological process, we need to determine whether an unobserved interaction between two things is merely coincidental or is actually due to a causal relationship. Now, this is particularly important as in the early stages of COVID and the long COVID story, all approaches to treating patients were based on correlations without necessarily being supported by causality, which led to some odd medications being thrown around. Now, it's important to highlight that's not a pure criticism. I mean, when you're dealing with an entirely new disease, it takes time for science to be able to demonstrate that cause and effect are truly linked. And things are catching up finally, it seems. Now, at this point, it's fair to state that for some patients, there is a cause and effect relationship between the generation of autoantibodies, antibodies that are directed at a patient's own body as a result of the COVID infection. And the development of long COVID symptomology might come from that in those patients. The twist here is that the researchers at the University of Virginia have now put forward a paper suggesting why those autoantibodies cause symptoms, because they might act like enzymes in a new term described as abzymes. Now, when I say this is hot off the press research, I literally mean that. This paper was published in the 22nd of July 2025, so this is brand new. So taking that this is brand new information, if we go backwards to the nature of a COVID-19 infection, most people are aware that the COVID-19 virus enters the cell via its spike protein binding to the ACE2. And in doing so, the spike protein then blocks the ACE2 from function as it should do. Now, for clarification here, the ACE2 is an enzyme and doesn't function as a receptor. However, certain viruses like COVID-19 use ACE2 as an entry point into the cell and thus are often described as being the ACE2 receptor in COVID conversations. Now, that's a crucial reframing that we need to establish before we go any further. So why does this matter? Because as the naming of ACE2 indicates, there's two main ACE enzymes in the body. And I think it's worthwhile to highlight at this point that ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. So to make things straightforward, the ACE enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And in turn, that leads to a rise in blood pressure, promotes fibrosis, inflammation, none of these being very positive. Now, a side note, this is why we use ACE inhibitors to treat blood pressure, because we're stopping that occurring. ACE Two, on the other hand, is a much nicer enzyme. It works in the opposite way. It converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1. Why does this matter? Because reducing angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 has the effect of reducing blood pressure, reducing inflammation, and reducing fibrosis. Basically, ACE2 activity counterbalances the activity of ACE. So if we go back to the fact that COVID-19 enters the cell via the ACE2 enzyme, that enzymatic capacity is massively degraded. Essentially, you're getting a virus shoving itself through a protein, making a port out of it. In doing so, this leads to increased angiotensin 2 levels 
and increased levels of inflammation because you kind of damaged that protective ACE2 enzyme by shoving a virus through it. Now, this isn't new information and it doesn't relate to antibodies either. So how does ACE2 relate to the University of Virginia's findings about antibodies? When the body detects an infection, it can raise antibodies to the antigens on the infective agent. In the case of COVID-19, the main antigen there is the virus spike protein. So given the spike protein binds to ACE2, i.e. the spike is a mirror image of ACE2, the antibodies directed towards the spike protein would look similar to ACE2 themselves. So the UVA team have suggested that these antibodies can be so similar to ACE that they then act like copies of the ACE. Little enzymes now no longer bound to the cell, but floating around the body. For clarification, the researchers confirm there is no relationship with these abnormal antibodies or abzymes and vaccination, suggesting it's something to do with the COVID-19 infection itself being a causative factor. Thus, we return to the concept of cause and effect. The UVA team did the most sensible thing they could. They took these suspected rogue antibodies from patients with long COVID and then tested the activity level of ACE2 in that blood. Then, when those antibodies were removed from the blood, that observed activity from ACE2 disappeared. Crucially, when these antibodies were removed from the blood, the observed enzymatic activity from ACE2 disappeared. I, we've been able to prove a causal correlation rather than just random chance. This discovery may explain why some long COVID patients experience issues with their blood pressure and have subsequent problems with fatigue. But more than just providing another bit of interest in the long COVID story, this might go some way to explaining why some patients have benefited from a treatment called plasma apheresis. This is essentially removing proteins and antibodies from the blood. However, what about the studies, such as a recent article in Nature, suggesting that plasma apheresis has no effect? Things we've had previous case studies suggested apheresis might give a benefit, but this, well, might be due to patient selection. So the recent paper from Nature was a very well-controlled trial. It was a randomized controlled trial, and that's one of the gold standard approaches for evaluating cause and effect. And here it showed no clear benefit. It might be that the work from UVA, which was acknowledged to target a narrow band of long COVID sufferers, might be able to be repurposed as a testing strategy to identify which patients might have a clinical benefit from apheresis. And that's the crucial thing here. At each step of the way, we're finding new things about COVID and long COVID. That's allowing us to review previous information, such as some people saying apheresis works and big studies saying it doesn't, suggesting that maybe it does work for some people and we need to find a way to identify those people. And it's possible this has done that. So I know that a lot of people affected by long COVID get quite demoralized about the lack of movement of the science, but I think this is a crucial bit to A, getting a better test, and B, getting ways that we can manage patients. I hope this has been a useful video. Um, if you'd like to put any questions in the comments, we'll see how we can come back to them. And yeah, take care, and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.